Jimmy Jackson, and they're going to give an update on the uh, West Side Transit Study Project. And after that, our legislative team, which is our own Yvonne Bellamy, but also Mike, uh, Mike Edwards from Kemper, and Krista Lacey is in town, our federal uh, lobbyist from Holland and Knight, and they're going to talk to us about uh, the legislative process and kind of some things that have been going on, but also as we get ready for uh, 2018. And then I want to take uh, five minutes, uh, ten minutes, and just uh, talk through what, what uh, we're seeing as uh, the, the bigger items on your agenda when you come back from the recess. So you're going to be gone for five weeks, and, and we want to give you some things to think about uh, while you're gone. And um, then um, James Mickle, who just does a dynamite job with the Norfolk Night Hawks program, was uh, out of town last, uh, last your last meeting, so we held off on giving you an update on the uh, the Nighthawks program, but he'll jump up and uh, do that. So with that, Mayor, I know you want to do a couple of introductions. Thank you, Mr. Manager. We have with us tonight uh, Cara Sylvester, who's an international student uh, in our internship program at Norfolk Circuit Court. She's from the University of Warwick in England. Uh, she's assisting Judge Migliozzi in the Circuit Court, and she's working uh, on an article for the Virginia Lawyer on mental health issues, as well as compiling a workbook on the death penalty to be used by the Virginia <coughs> Court. Supreme Court judges. Carl, will you please stand and uh, just take a second? Yeah. Also, uh, our new city assessors here, Pete Rona, uh, <coughs> Pete, uh, holds uh, the CAE and RES professional de designations from the International Association of Assessing Officers. He is past president uh, of the uh, International Association of Assessors, Assessing Officers. Pete, welcome. Where is Pete? There you are. Yes, hey, sir. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you. I want to say thank you for the opportunity. I, I've, I've met so many people that struggling to remember the names, but that will come with time. But I, I just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this team. I'm very excited about this opportunity, and so uh, I'm looking forward to a long and healthy relationship. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. All right, Mr. Manager. All right, thank you, Mayor. So again, um, uh, in terms of your docket out front, um, R1. Um, withdrawn by the applicant. You also have a, um, an ordinance that we're going to add to the agenda at your place uh, that allows us, uh, that has you all um, appropriate some monies that comes into the sheriff's office. Sheriff gets a per diem for, uh, from the United States Marshal that, uh, for housing federal prisoners. Uh, that per diem, uh, as I think you all know, pays for a number of different things, including uh, bonuses for some of his employees for um, a fitness uh, supplement as well as a tenure-based supplement for some of his um, civilian employees um, and if there is money available to, to pay for some equipment. Uh, because you all don't meet for five weeks, uh, if we didn't get this, uh, this money appropriated, then um, it would impact their pay. So we just wanted to add that on. I think everybody's straightforward. You've got a memo from Greg Patrick and that actual ordinance um, at your place. So with that, I'd ask uh, Stephanie Isles to step up and... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Um, We've really, we have some boards that need to be filled, yes. and I, we didn't get to it. If for some reason the um, formal session gets done early, would anybody have a problem sitting and finalizing that? Because it, it's not that many, um, but we need to get some in because some have expired or over. It just, we could do it up there at the dais. Yes. I mean, question. Does anybody have a problem there, or do you guys want to wait five weeks? I think it's it may be wishful thinking, but if we can go fast and get you in th this done in 45 minutes, and maybe give you 15 minutes. Uh, right. Not to put any we'll pressure see. on you, Stephanie. I talk fast. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having us. The Norfolk Electoral Court and I are here to discuss a couple of precinct relocations and a precinct boundary change request. Um, we realize you're going to be going on your retreat, so we're trying to get this in. So when you come back from your retreat, this could be held for public hearing and council vote. The first is to move from the current Ocean View Elementary School into the new Ocean View Elementary School. The second, moving from the Larchmont Recreation Center behind Larchmont Elementary School into the new school. Those are both um, completing construction. The students will be moving in in September. We hope to be in there for the elections in November. We'd also like to change the precinct name from Old Dominion to Larchmont School, which is the name of the facility for the voters. 
Our precinct boundary change request is to extend Larchmont Library Precinct, which the current precinct is broken up by the orange line there with Old Dominion, extend that down Magnolia Avenue to Jamestown Crescent at the bridge, bring these voters in this section here over to Larchmont Library. That will essentially double the size of the registered voters in Larchmont Library Precinct and reduce the number of voters in the current Old Dominion Precinct which will become Larchmont School. That will drop the current active voters down to 3,351, making it a more manageable precinct, helping to reduce the lines. Of course, you're going to be going on break, so we would request notification through the city attorney's office and the city clerk's office for a public hearing and council vote when you return session in August. As we have the November general election coming up for the gubernatorial race, um, we would be sending out notifications to all the voters, notifying them through the civic leagues, to letting them know of those changes, and that will impact elections beginning in November. That's it. Pretty quick. Right, thank you. Any all questions? Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Wayne Green is going to jump up for a moment, and I'm um, sorry, William, and um, <laughs> just make you uh, make the public aware as much as anything and give Ms. McClellan and, and Dr. Ridley a chance to comment on um, uh, public fishing situation over in uh, Columbia. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of Council. In 2016, the residents of the Colonial Place Review Civically, they sent a letter to the city requesting that we lift a partial ban of the no fishing crabbing ordinance on Mayflower Road on the bulkhead. Public, um, the Departments of Recreation, Parks, Open Space, um, General Services, the Health Department, and the Police Department. We met on a couple of occasions to figure out how we could accommodate that request. We brought a number of possible options to the Civic League for them to consider. And on June 12th, the Civic League voted in favor of lifting a partial ban based on the green line that you see right there. This was going to come up for a vote. Uh, we had some conversation in the agenda meeting, and it was decided we just there was enough uncertainty that we weren't ready for um, for it to come before you all. But there's an expectation from some of the folks in the public that we might have a, that we would have a vote tonight. And I know Ms. McClellan and, and Dr. Ridley uh, wanted uh, her, their six peers to know a little bit more about some of the thinking in the community. letters to all the residents of Colonial Place for review and notifying them of the proposed change and welcomed input and engagement from them. So um, there was concern that this was a Civic League only vote that we were considering and in fact we are actually taking, we have notified every resident and uh, and asked them to weigh in on this on this issue and we continue to receive uh, input both pro and con um, and we'll take that into consideration to vote on it again. Or we'll, we'll, we do vote on it rather. So is anybody curious about this? I mean, because there, we are hearing a lot of side, both sides, and those that are in opposition are concerned about litter. They're concerned about um, problems with wildlife, with fishing lines left on. They're concerned about um, noise. They're concerned what else? Um, they feel that some of the people have argued that there's access to fishing off of Granby Street Bridge, that that should be close enough. Um, I don't know. I would say it's about equal the comments we've heard this okay. far. Has anybody? Have you all been copied on these? Two emails and two physical letters opposing it. That's it. I haven't had anybody in favor, but that's usually the case. Specifically, voted twenty-eight three. to three in favor. Um, I've received approximately half and half, a fifty-fifty in favor, fifty in con. Um, in my, if we were to consider this, I would suggest we would do it so that it would subset after a year. So we basically create a pilot program to confirm whether or not this works um, and that we would uh, uh, enforce uh, the regulation and that we would be looking at it um, after after sunset um, and enforce trash and, and everything else so I would only do it under those circumstances but I think we need to get a little bit more input from the neighbors um, and I'm, I'm pleased that we have um, further engaged the city's the citizens so thank you for that so so, Councilwoman, for the, the ones who are in opposition, has this recommendation been brought to them that it be a possible uh, pilot after one year? Uh, some of the folks who have opposed have said if this were to go forward, they would ask it to be a pilot. That's been only very informally. Yeah, nothing. Okay. There's been nothing. No. 
formal. My question to Daryl and to um, is, do we have the capacity to enforce this and to keep this clean? Uh, we'd have to enhance our enforcement, but we'd actually en enhance and actually expand our trash pickup. We'd have to put additional trash barrels out, and we'd have to have patrols by our park rangers and the NPD. We right. could make it happen as a pilot. The other question that I have um, that Dr. Webby and I have discussed is where are there, where is fishing allowed in the city of Norfolk? It's not publicized question. anywhere. Mm -hmm. but we'll get that answer for you. I don't know what those options are. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, uh, William Harrell is here from uh, HRT. And I mentioned his team of Ray Amoroso and uh, Jamie Jackson. And they're going to give you an update on the West Side Transit Study Project. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manager, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, staff, and, and certainly members of the public. It's our pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, before we start uh, the brief presentation, I certainly want to thank uh, Councilman Thomas for his participation in the christening of a new ferry that serves both Norfolk and Portsmouth. Um, with the opening of a Waterside Live development, ridership has really skyrocketed on the ferry. So I would certainly invite you to come out and uh, take a look at uh, all that's being done. So thank you very much for your participation. Uh, as the managers indicated, uh, Mr. Amoruso will follow me, uh, who will also be followed by uh, Jamie Jackson. We intend to provide the relevant background as relates to the purpose and need of this particular study. Uh, while there are several alternatives that are part of the Tier 1 analysis, we will review them in a somewhat big-picture perspective. Uh, we can certainly drill down as your time permits, uh, if you would like. Uh, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with council members individually uh, to review this information in greater detail, uh, as well as to address any service issues or questions that you may have. Finally, uh, uh, after Jamie uh, presents, I will very briefly uh, address the strategic view of transit funding, which we think will be relevant uh, as you prepare your upcoming legislative package. So at this time, I'll invite Mr. Amar Russo to the podium. Good evening, Mary Alexander and fellow councilmen and women and city manager Smith. Um, we're very excited to be here today. We've been working very diligently with your staff as we got the study underway. I wanted to thank personally Thelma Drake and Jeff Verlisti for attending practically every meeting we've had to date since the study's come underway. We're here to talk about the uh, Norfolk, what we call the Norfolk uh, Station, uh, Naval Station Norfolk Transit Extension Study, the West Side Extension. Um, there is a history of looking at extending high capacity transit. Uh, I know most folks think it's automatically going to be light rail, but we're looking at different technologies to the Naval Station Norfolk. Um, it goes back as far as, as you can see in this graphic here, 1996 in various forms of study. Uh, but the linchpin study I want to focus on is that the one that we started in 2013 and ended in 2015, which came up with a recommendation of potential alignments on that served the eastern side of the city and the western side of the city, and that's depicted on this graphic. There were some clouds of how they would connect, some unknowns. We could not come to resolution with the public involvement um, in terms of exactly what alignment would connect to the existing tide, and that's what those big clouds represent. The funding in place for the west side study is provided by regional surface transportation funds through the Transportation Planning Organization. It's fully funded. It's a 12-month study. But essentially, we had intended from 2015 to carry this forward to the next phase of project development, which was the development of more information related to the environmental impact study that's required in the federal process, because this project was indeed going to be funded uh, partially uh, by federal funds. So there are certain requirements because of that. However, the Federal Transit Administration said, uh, before you embark upon the environmental studies that are required, we need you to identify a reasonable alternative in the western side of the city, a west corridor, so to speak, prior to entry into that um, documentation process. So the purpose of the study is to explore in partnership with the city a potential high-capacity transit connection that uh, connects from the existing tide light rail station on the western part of the city and connects directly to the Naval Station Norfolk with intermediate destinations along the way, and there are many that Jamie will talk about, but essentially is to fill in the gap of the cloud. What is the right street that the alignment has to run on? And 
uh, work through the process of defining the technology, and that's why we're here today. Um, purpose and need, which is one of the requirements by the federal government. Why is this transportation investment needed? Uh, what is the problem you're trying to solve? It's very evident uh, for anyone that's lived here for any uh, deal of time. The efficient movement of the military and civilian personnel back and forth to the Naval Station Norfolk is critical, as it says here, to the region and to the city in particular, uh, and also to the military in terms of state of readiness. There's between 60 and 70,000 uh, commuters every day that commute uh, for one reason or another to the Navy base. That parking is a representation uh, of what occurs on the Naval Station Norfolk every day. They are at capacity and have no room at the end for any additional parking. The military has expressed quite clearly uh, their excitement about the potential of high capacity transit being extended to the base. We want to enhance mobility and access to the base. But we want to partner with the city with its redevelopment and economic development plans for all the intermediate destinations and changes that are occurring daily within the city. And most importantly, we want to make a fiscally responsible transit decision on what that investment will be and what kind of financial partnership will be with the state and with the federal government. Jamie's going to come up here. Jamie Jackson uh, is going to come up here and talk a little bit about the alternatives that we have identified. Thank you, Mr. Amoruso. Again, um, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and of course, City Manager Smith. So I'm actually going to go through at a very high level the alternatives that we have developed. I do want to just say specifically thank you um, to Jeff Felisky and also uh, Thelma Drake <coughs> as they are our city partners are working with us on the project. So where we are today is we've developed 14 um, alternatives. So when I say the word alternative, that literally means the path. How are we going to get from our current infrastructure to the Navy base? We have 12 of those alternatives that will really look at all modes of transit, which I'll talk about shortly. And two of those, uh, um, two of those alternatives are really going to look at bus only. So in front of you today, you see those main 12 alternatives that we're looking at. So when we're looking at the west side of Norfolk, obviously we have to look at the full gamut of options or opportunities that may be available. The study has to evaluate really what's the feasibility along these paths. Um, they're grouped together just for the sake of the cluster <coughs> effect of, um, of the alternative. So we're looking at streets like Granby Street, um, Finchurch. Are we going down Llewellyn, Collie, Monticello, uh, Bush Street? So we really have to take it at, you know, when we're looking at the alternatives, we're starting at the, uh, the tide station and literally going up all of those alternatives to see what is the best fit. So you may ask, how are we evaluating those? What tools are we utilizing? We've already met with the planning departments. We'll be meeting with traffic and engineering. And we've been meeting with other groups, including our key stakeholders, to see kind of what works with the fabric of the city, what works with those particular neighborhoods. And also what's uh, feasible. As you know, we do have some resiliency challenges and flooding challenges in Nor um, Norfolk. So we need to make sure that when we're evaluating those alternatives that we consider those. We'll be looking at these from the sake of at-grade crossings. Um, do we have to uh, evaluate these alternatives as it relates to power lines? And of course, as I mentioned, um, being in the right of way um, of um, Norfolk Southern. So we really are taking a high level look today um, we're going to whittle these uh, alternatives down to probably two or three, evaluate those in detail, also look at ridership numbers at that point, and then come to the city um, with a preferred alternative at the end. But what we want to make sure that we do in this process is make sure that the city and the public has enough information to make an informed decision about an alternative on the west side and or if there's a no-build alternative, which could potentially be an option from this study. So at a high level, I just want to go over um, the mode alternatives. So we can't assume, as Mr. Amoruso mentioned, that it's going to be light rail. There are other options. So I'll start off, start off with bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit, if you think about it, is really light rail and rubber tires. It can operate in mixed traffic, or it can have dedicated right away. It doesn't require as much infrastructure as you may see for the light rail uh, system that we have today. Um, you have stops that are a little less frequent than you may see for um, our fixed route bus system. You have off-board fare payment. You have level boarding. You have real-time arrival information at the, the train station. So it's really more than just bus service. Um, and it's a model that we see in Cleveland. 
in other areas that has worked well, and also in Richmond, they're developing uh, the Pulse today. Modern streetcar, similar to what we see for light rail, it's a smaller vehicle. So as you know, there's some tight turns in smaller streets um, in the city of Norfolk, and this may be a good fit for some of the alternatives that we're looking at. So your frequency of stops may be two to three every, every two to three city blocks, which again gives you that feel of going, getting off and on the bus. So maybe you're going to the medical college, maybe you're going to ODU, maybe you're going to shops in Ghent or Cali area. This provides an alternative for us to look at. Um, it can be on, well, it can look at um, both the off-wire solutions. So there may be smaller, smaller areas that we won't be connected to those overhead wires that you see today for light rail, but ultimately you'll see that same type of in infrastructure. And then of course the light rail system. We have the tides, so for time's sake I won't go into that. But again, we've got three modes that we need to make sure that we clearly review um, and vet, for lack of a better term, for each of these alignments um, to make sure what, or to look at what's a good fit for um, each of these alternatives. So the project process. We started the project in May. We've identified all 14 Tier 1 alternatives, as I mentioned before. What we're doing now is going through that screening process, so really being diligent in our efforts to see if there's a viable alternative on the west side or a few alternatives on the west side that we can look at further. Once we get to those two or three, again, we'll take that deep dive into those alternatives, and so you'll be able to see more data and information about the potential of high-capacity transit with various modes on these alternatives. In September, we'll be coming back to the public and um, to the council with these alternatives to get your feedback and guidance. Again, this is a project that is both a partnership between HRT and the city, so we need to make sure that we're both invested um, in this effort and we're making the right decision for Norfolk. And then at the end of this process, we will end up with a preferred alternative, which we will look at in the next phase of study um, against the uh, east side alternative, which is the military circle highway area that came out of the last study, as Mr. Amoruso mentioned. So that's the conclusion of this um, piece of the presentation, and we'll answer questions at the end. Just two brief slides, but we felt it was very relevant to address the transit funding issue, which we think is very important. When you look at one of the largest employers of this region, um, such as Naval Station Norfolk, 23 percent of those going there, uh, the largest amount are coming from Virginia Beach followed by Norfolk at 19 percent. Uh, you've got Chesapeake at 12, the peninsula, you see the numbers there, and even 26 percent coming from other areas uh, within our region. Based on the current cost allocation plan, any extension of the tide uh, or any other public transportation is borne by the city uh, that the, the improvement falls within. So therefore, uh, based on the current model, the city of Norfolk would have the burden of both the operating costs as well as the local capital. So as you look to address your legislative package, we thought it was very important to address the major sources of revenue uh, that support public transportation today. Uh, on the federal point, uh, uh, as there were proposed budget cuts to uh, transportation funding, uh, in the president's budget, we certainly will be working with the congressional delegation to sustain that transit funding. Now, that is absolutely critical because a project of this magnitude, although we don't have cost estimates, you can assume that it would be a new starts project. Uh, and at this point, uh, that is very much a federal process, and our hope is that that is maintained so that that continues to be an option to fund the Naval Station project. At the state level, and this isn't new to you, uh, there is a funding cliff as it relates to state capital funding. Uh, in fiscal year 19, 130 million will be needed to maintain the status quo. I had the opportunity today to address the Hampton Roads um, um, delegation on this issue. It's a very important issue that we hope the legislature will address. There is a study committee uh, that's uh, involved in that right now. Uh, the important note we want to make there, this is our state of good repair. This isn't for expansion projects. This is to purchase buses and to maintain service. For Hampton Roads Transit over our six-year capital budget, that's about $40 million. Fairbox, 
you know, certainly one of the things that we have uh, really stepped forward uh, as it relates to uh, making sure that all participate uh, in the additional cost for public transportation, and we are increasing our fares October 27th, uh, of 2017. And finally, uh, the point that we've continued to make is we certainly want to work at the federal and state level so that we can relieve some of the pressure uh, that it, that it uh, relates to city funding of public transportation. Certainly, we're working on a regional strategy. We think just as you had HB 2313 that provides a regional source for roads, bridges, and tunnels, which we support greatly, we use those facilities as well. There is a need for a regional dedicated funding source to take that pressure off of our municipalities. So as you look to develop your legislative initiatives, we certainly want to work uh, with your team in addressing that. So we are available for any questions that you may have, Mr. Manager. Mr. Riddick. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, question I have, um, uh, the west side, the environmental uh, impact still on the west side, um, is that, it sounded like to me that that was mandatory. Um, if we're going to follow the federal process, which we are, because right. we're seeking federal funds, it will be mandatory to evaluate both the east side and the west side in an environmental document. Okay. So the next phase, which is funded, the state came up with uh, uh, almost 96% uh, of the funding for the next phase to do the environmental study. It's matched by 4% by the city. Right. Um, so the next phase is funded. Uh, so it will be both the east side and the west side evaluated equally to okay. determine which one is the best alternative moving right. forward. The federal government only allows one car to be funded at a time. You know, um, we, we talked about this some time ago, and they haven't talked about it recently. And it's been my experience that the most expensive part of uh, light rail is uh, acquiring the right of way. And uh, in regards to, um, you'd be surprised, uh, Mr. Harrell, you had come on board. But you'd be surprised at how much it cost us to acquire right away for the for the tide. I mean, even some of the most uh, ridiculously small lots became more expensive because of the tide and the purpose of it. And um, that's why I recommended some time ago Church Street because we own the right of way. If you think about Church Street, you know you have a traffic median that runs from right at uh, City Hall Avenue, right straight down uh, to past Forest Lawn Cemetery. And so uh, this is something that I think that uh, we should, you know, really evaluate is what the cost would be to acquire uh, the right-of-way. Uh, some of those uh, eminent domain lawyers, too, in particular, the name I won't call, made a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of money representing uh, uh, different property owners. We also had to pay a whole lot of money for businesses uh, that were the business that had, their business were interrupted, you know, right around uh, Duke Street, Duke Street, and all that, you know, uh, we've spent a lot of money, you know, on that. So as we move forward, uh, I still believe that the uh, the Church Street uh, area would be the best route because we own the right of way. We get up to. Um, City Park at 38th Street, you can use some of these shuttle buses to take 38th Street around Park Avenue to the back of ODU. Um, the Granby Street Bridge would probably, not probably, would need, you know, some uh, extensive uh, re uh, regirding, should I say, or girding up. And then in some instances, we'd have to underground some utilities. So uh, that would be, that would be my vote uh, on that. Uh, Norfolk was very successful in, uh, Put a couple of things down in our light rail effort. Uh, first time out of the box, uh, we it, we it cost us just about forty two million dollars a mile, and uh, that's that's the lowest uh, per mile in the in the United States. Period. Uh, the city share was eight million dollars, which is about seventeen percent, but that's seventeen and a half million, and uh, uh, I mean for that seven and a half mile of tracks. So um, it's a very expensive undergoing, and with everything that we have going on in the city, you know, we're talking about uh, St. Paul Boulevard Quadrant, and so it's, uh, we had to be very, very aggressive, you know, in regards to, you know, this effort. Uh, I, you know, and so I just think that we should 
you know, just really consider the fact that we don't have to acquire so much of a right of way. Uh, as I know you're going to do a thorough study, but that my experience and the money it cost us for right of way, the money it cost us for businesses that were uh, in peril for a while, I think we should look at those costs and try to control that, and that will make the entire uh, effort a, a lot easier. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Smeagol? Oh, yeah. Um, kind of a statement and a question first. Um, how is it determined which one was going to be studied first, the Tier 2 or Tier 1? There's been conversations here on Council that the military highway, which is the Tier 2 one, just made absolutely more sense than bringing this down through flooded areas. And my statement is that anything that anywhere that this takes it through flooding should automatically be taken off the list. If, if there's any, we're, as a resilient city, we should not be running this train, if it, that's what it is, or any rapid bus through anything that floods. Um, and to me, that would save you a lot of money just by taking those routes off. I, and I know you did tier one and tier two. Tier one is now expanded to 12 alternatives. And is tier two gonna have the same amount of alternatives and I'm just curious how all of a sudden the momentum shifted back to Hampton Boulevard when I thought it was sounding more like that this council had more of a priority of moving it more towards military highway, which is what I would have studied first on that. Um, that's a lot in that question. It is. But let me, let me make <laughs> it's the first time I've had the opportunity to ask it publicly. And, and that's fine. Because I can't get the answers privately with the previous administration. And let me make so. it really clear, as clear as possible for everyone so there's no confusion. Um, the Tier 1 and Tier 2 are germane only to the West Side study in terms of the universe of alternatives and winnowing it down to a smaller set to find the one for the West Side. The East Side alignment that you see here that's more or less focused on Military Highway, Little Creek Boulevard, and going through the master plan of redevelopment for Military Circle, that alignment was defined except for the master plan and how right. it would filter through there. So it was set aside because the federal government, which is funding the study, said, you need the same kind of definition on the west side before you begin the, uh, the before you begin the environmental impact statement. We need to define, and so there's no priority. They just said, we want you to figure out, is there a viable alternative? And that is a question that they said to you. Do the study to find out if there really is a viable alternative on the west side. Is it resilient and sustainable? Will it run in the public right away, or do you need a massive amount of private property? Because I must mention um, that for the most part, we are looking at public right-of-ways and all 14 alternatives that we're examining in the west side. There's no private. For the whole part, there's no Norfolk Southern Railroad right-of-way we're looking to acquire. For the most part, we want to run in the public right-of-way. Yes, there will be slivers of land here and there needed for turning radii and some access changes. But for the most part, the 11-mile uh, extension is going to run in the public right-of-way in any of the 14 alternatives. So for the west side study, this alignment here, the universe of 14 alignment alternatives that we worked out with the general public, screened down to two or three that can look at detailed analysis, and then ask the question, is the cost versus the ridership gained versus the sustainability investment worth a build alternative in the west side? If there is none, then uh, that's fine. The federal government said that's a fine answer. If there is, bring it into the <coughs> environmental document and measure it against the east side. Determine your capital cost, your operating cost, your ridership potential for both the west side and the east side, and let the numbers speak for themselves. That's how they see it in a non-political environment. And what's the e timeline on the east side study? It, it would only it'd be, be after, after it'll the be elimination after the west of the west. Okay. The way they want to see it, and the feds want to do everything sequential, is figure out your figure out your challenge in the west side. Oh, Mr. 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 Strange, come in. All right, thank you, Mr. Manager. Anything else? Uh, uh, we're good we there. Have uh, uh, a uh, question? Go ahead, Mr. Manager. Yeah, I mean, let's just don't cut it off like that. Uh, my question, Ray, did we ever, uh, did Norfolk ever apply for funds in the legislative package for the West Side study? No, sir. The no, uh, regional surface transportation money came through the transportation planning organization okay. that flows to HRT to do the study. Okay. Um, so it's being funded through the federal funds that come to the TPO okay. to fund the study. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to see you. Appreciate everything you're doing for us. Um, we will move quickly to um, Yvonne Bellamy, who is our international, uh, our uh, intergovernmental relations manager, who has hit the ground running and 
Um, she has, uh, as I said earlier, Mike Edwards from Kemper Consulting who helps us with the General Assembly, and Chris DeLacy from Holland and Knight that helps us at the federal level, and they're going to give us a, um, an update of um, uh, legislative process. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, and Mr. Smith. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a legislative report. I'm pleased to be joined by Krista Lacey. I don't think you all have met him. And also Mike Edwards. So tonight I will share the outcome of a few bills that were on the city's radar during the 2017 General Assembly session and the timeline to follow in adopting our 2018 legislative package. Afterwards, Mike will highlight interim studies, 2018 to 2020 budget pressures, and go over key 2018 General Assembly dates. Following Mike, Chris will provide a federal report. During the 2017 General Assembly session, nearly 3,000 bills were introduced and over 1,700 of them became law. Most of the laws took effect on July 1. As previously mentioned, I will highlight several bills that were on the city's radar. First, the decriminalization of simple possession of marijuana. Several bills decriminalizing simple possession of marijuana were introduced during the 2017 General Assembly session. However, they were referred to the Virginia State Crime Commission for study. And from now through August the 25th, the commission is seeking written input from stakeholders with an interest in this study. The responses and findings will be presented during the October 5th Crime Commission meeting in Richmond. So if this city would like to submit a formal letter in support of decriminalizing simple possession of marijuana, I will gladly draft and share it with the Crime Commission. Driver's license forfeiture due to simple possession of marijuana. Before July 1, any convicted person um, of marijuana possession automatically had their driver's license suspended for six months. Now, judges have the discretion to suspend or not suspend the driver's license of an adult convicted of marijuana, simple possession marijuana. However, if convicted adults have their driver's license not suspended, they must do 50 hours of community service. This legislation, it received bipartisan support and it showed grace for convicted adults needing their license to commute to and from work. We all are aware that police traffic stops can sometimes spiral out of control. Now, Virginia law mandates each driver education program and public school systems include instruction on how to interact with law enforcement officers during traffic stops. Per the 2016 National Center for Educational Statistics, more than one out of every five students report being bullied. Now, the Code of Virginia requires public school principals to notify the parent or guardian of any student involved in an alleged incident of bullying within five school days of such allegation. Light removal in event of an emergency. The Department of Neighborhood Development asked me about this legislation in February. It's now clarified in state code localities that must demolish or repair blighted property and the event of an emergency can pass along incurred costs to property owners. Airbnb. For the past few General Assembly sessions, Airbnb has been discussed and debated. This session, legislation allowing localities to adopt ordinances regulating the registration of persons offering short-term rentals was passed. Individuals that fail to register face a penalty of up to $500. I must note that licensed realtors will be exempt from the registration. Does that mean licensed realtors who have an Airbnb or licensed realtors book an Airbnb for a client? If I'm not mistaken, I think it's all licensed realtors. I can double check in, okay. let you know. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So lastly, community wealth building. The General Assembly approved $7.5 million for creating wealth in the community. The City of Norfolk was awarded over $243,000 with the potential for four one-year renewals. The funding will be used in support of employment training opportunities for poverty-stricken behavioral health consumers 
and per Norfolk Community Services Board, in the first year, a minimum of 75 individuals with behavioral health disorders who are under 200% of the federal poverty level will be served. Now, I will quickly provide a timeline for adopting the city's 2018 legislative package. From now to early August, the process of identifying legislative priorities will take place. And as we progress through the summer, I will attend Mr. Smith's one-on-one -on -one meetings with council members to assist in capturing legislative priorities for the 2018 General Assembly. Also of note, the General Assembly delegation will formally be introduced to Mr. Smith and the city's executive team this Thursday. In September, an introductory list of priorities will be shared at the council retreat with additional priorities considered after the retreat to early November, the legislative package will be finalized, and between early November to early December, the legislative package will be adopted and shared with our General Assembly delegation. So to that end, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Manager, thank you for the opportunity to be here, Kemper Consulting. Appreciates the opportunity to work again with the City of Norfolk as we help you between now and the beginning of the General Assembly in January to develop a strategic legislative package. Want to accomplish two goals quickly this evening. One, run through a couple items that I think will be of interest as we lead into the General Assembly and then may lead to significant legislation during the session that we'll be uh, watching very carefully and working on possibly. And then second, talk about some of the state's budget pressures. Joint Subcommittee on Coastal Flooding is entering its fourth and final authorized year to date. I think it's fair to say they've worked largely on helping the state get its house in order to help localities, although Chairman Stolle and Vice Chairman Locke are working hard to obtain additional state dollars for local and regional map, uh, match money for the Army Corps. They took the first step last year, hope to take the second step next this coming year, and they also are continuing to push the adoption of a resiliency officer in the state that would cross jurisdictional boundaries within the state government to assist localities. Joint subcommittee to evaluate tax preferences. That's a standing committee. The concern here is historic tax preferences. I don't think there's a disagreement in Richmond about the importance and the effectiveness of the policy regarding historic rehabilitation tax credits. The issue is there are some appropriators who want to cap the amount of dollars that are appropriated annually to the program. And obviously, it has been a huge success to traditional older cities like Norfolk, Richmond, et cetera, and we want to certainly protect that program. Mental Health Services in the Commonwealth, commonly referred to as the Deeds Commission, is entering its fourth year. It will go on for two more years. The prime consideration this year and probably next year is reformation of our CSB policy statewide and hopefully additional funding for them. Virginia Wireless Communications Infrastructure work. I know your land use team has worked closely with VML. This is entering the third year of negotiations, sometimes heated, between local governments and the wireless industry regarding protecting, and our interest in protecting local government land use authority um, as the industry seeks to site more smaller, mid-sized towers. And then the last one I want to note is the Joint Subcommittee on Local Government Fiscal Stress. This really was generated by the problem in Petersburg, but I think that the members of that Joint Subcommittee, at least in the second year, so maybe a year from now, want to put on the table tax you know, authorities of local governments, those that currently work well, and hopefully those that don't work as well. Mr. Mayor, uh, as we look forward to the 18th session, we know it's a new biennial budget. The outgoing governor, Governor McAuliffe, will introduce um, the new biennial budget in December. The General Assembly will act on that, and then the new governor will have an opportunity to act on the recommendations of the General Assembly. Revenue forecast projections we know will con continue to be moderate, if not conservative. We're not going to see dramatic revenue growth. I think the Chairman of Appropriations and the, and the Co-Chairman of Senate Finance will echo that when you see them between now and then. The state finished the year, the Commonwealth finished the year, FY17, with $132 million carry forward. We don't call it a surplus in Virginia, it's a carry forward. Um, and under the current budget, the appropriators had agreed to set aside 50 percent of that into an active reserve fund, not the rainy day fund, but a more agile, if you will, reserve fund. House uh, leadership last week called for the entire $132 million to be sent to this reserve fund for protection. And the reason for that is important. S&P has put Virginia on negative watch going forward due to what it believes is over-reliance on the use of the rainy day fund. And then lastly, we just want to give you some of the spending increase pressures that the General Assembly and Governor are facing. 
Medicaid and, and K through 12 funding make up approximately just under 50 percent of all general fund expenditures by the state. And each two years, we reforecast Medicaid funding and K through 12. Those were the increases this time two years ago. So we would expect the increases to be fairly dramatic as it relates to Medicaid and public uh, education funding. I'm really going to skip the last key dates. You can look at that at your leisure. Um, again, maybe the most important would be as it relates to budget and revenues, and that's August 21 when the governor will close out the year and provide us with the actual dollar amounts. And then we'll get the new revenue forecast in December. Thank you all. Welcome, Chris. I think this is the first time you've been before this group, so we're thrilled to have you. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mr. Mayor, good to see you again. Members of the council, uh, Mr. Manager, appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Chris DeLacy, and I am a partner at Holland and Knight in Washington, D.C. I have represented uh, the city of Norfolk for uh, going on t uh, over 12 years, uh, uh, advocating for your federal agenda in Washington. And I have some good news and bad news <clears throat> from Washington. The bad news is that our federal government is uh, finding new ways to be dysfunctional. Uh, the good news is that despite this dysfunction, uh, the city's agenda is moving forward, uh, and the uh, latest uh, evidence of this agenda moving forward is uh, Mayor Alexander's visit to Washington, D.C. last week. We had a round of uh, meetings, um, uh, productive meetings, with the White House, with the Army Corps of Engineers headquarters staff at the Pentagon, and with HUD Secretary Ben Carson. We also met with the uh, congressional delegation, Senators Warner and Kane, and uh, Congressman Bobby Scott and Congressman Scott Taylor. Uh, during all of these meetings, we discussed the Norfolk Flood Control Project, and I'm happy to report that the project is uh, moving forward successfully and ahead of schedule, two words that you normally don't associate with Army Corps of Engineers projects. Uh, and I think that this, uh, the fact that the project has moved forward uh, uh, so, so, uh, so well is really a tribute to the leadership of, of this city. Um, and the Corps has mentioned that to me several times. And they even use the city of Norfolk as an example when they're talking to other cities of the best way to partner with the Army Corps of Engineers. So you all should be very proud of that. Um, the city identified uh, it had a flooding problem early on and uh, took steps to address that, that issue. Um, they paid, as you know, you paid for a flood control study, a private study, and that continues to pay dividends to this day. The Army Corps continues to use data from that study uh, to advance their own study, and that's one of the main reasons why the timeline has moved uh, forward so quickly. Um, and so I think the city deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, but there is a caveat here. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the phase that the project is in now is the study phase. Um, we're hoping that the uh, uh, study will be wrapped up in early 2019. We're actually working to try to speed that timeline up a bit so we can uh, mesh with the congressional schedule for authorizing the next phase of the, of the project, which is the construction phase. And that is really the, the heavy lift for this project. And that's where uh, the city leadership, or Mayor Alexander, where the congressional delegation are all going to have to work together to move that project forward. Um, but I'm confident that will happen, and I'm confident that the project will be brought to a successful conclusion. Um, it's too important not to be successful, and so um, uh, I, I think that everything is headed in, 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 in a positive way. In addition to talking to, uh, about the flood control project, we also uh, discussed the city's plans for the St. Paul area. That was of particular interest to uh, Secretary Carson and his staff at HUD. Uh, as you know, many of those uh, uh, planned improvements are closely related to the citywide flooding issues. Um, and then finally, we also discussed uh, the city's desire to improve the pedestrian pathway next to the customs facility. That building, as you know, is a historic building. It is owned by the General Services Administration, and the primary tenant is the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and specifically the Customs and Border Patrol. And so we have been meeting on a regular basis with both GSA and CBP uh, to move that process forward. We have uh, a stakeholders meeting scheduled for August. 
with CBP that we can hopefully um, go through any remaining issues. And I'm confident that after that meeting, we'll have a path forward as to how, how to move uh, those, those improvements uh, to fruition. Um, in addition to those issues during my 12 years doing work for the city, uh, the city has shown leadership on issues related to transportation, related to homelessness, um, related to uh, first responders and law enforcement, and I expect uh, that leadership to continue uh, under Mayor Alexander, and I look forward to working with all of you on advancing that agenda. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? Mike, okay. Mr. Manager. Chris, thank you. So, so Mayor, we really wanted you all to have a chance to see the delegation. As you all know, um, come uh, uh, next January, uh, things get a little crazy. We, we are reacting to a lot of things, I and mean, you've got 3,000 bills introduced and 1,700 passed. Uh, we don't have time for these folks to come sit down and let you see them, but the main message we want you to know is you've got a, a strong team in place and a coordinated effort, and uh, we really appreciate you all y'all being with us. So, um, okay. Kim, I'd ask you Ms. to... Ms. Ray. Oh, I'm sorry. I have one quick question. Yes, when we do our legislative priorities, and I think Mamie hit on it um, last year or the year before with regard to local public schools, but is it possible that, and we may have talked about it before, is it possible that we could look at, I look, if we could look at what other cities' legislative priorities are, and then underscore those as things that are important to Portsmouth and Norfolk and Virginia Beach and Chesapeake. We may have individual priorities, but there's got to be at least one or two or three things that we all agree on. And when we send it to, when we send our delegation, they have to deal with their, you know, they interact with their colleagues that represent other cities that there would be highlighted this is also important to Portsmouth. This is also important to Chesapeake. And I don't think we've done that in the past, but it might make a difference in terms of helping the General Assembly members know that, you know, this is not something I'm out here on an island by myself with. A great thought. I think uh, what we do do is the Hampshire Rose delegation, the caucus does meet mm -hmm. on occasion. The uh, uh, Yvonne and her mm -hmm. peers meet on occasion. But I think the idea of really identifying those specific things is good. And actually the... Hepburn Rose delegation met this morning. Yes. All right. Okay. Mr. Manager. All right. So, Kim, if you would, I'm going to jump up just to be out of y'all's way, Mayor, and I think I can do this in, in five minutes or less. It, it, it's really, you know, what I'll also do, because we're doing this quickly, is, because um, I want to have a couple minutes for James at the end, is um, I'll put this in your packet on Friday. But really what this is intended to do is be a little bit thought-provoking for you all as you take five weeks and, as Mr. Riddick says, it gives us an opportunity to maybe get ourselves in a little bit of trouble uh, while y'all aren't uh, watching over us. <laughs> so we want to give you a chance to know what it is we really want to focus on uh, when we come back. And so we've put these up here really in the um, – and these are the things that I think you all will be addressing and, and having conversations about. So when you look at housing, uh, we'll come back probably at your, at your retreat and talk about the uh, Strengthening Neighborhoods pilot. Remember, our whole housing strategy is uh, strengthening neighborhoods on one hand and uh, the deconcentration of poverty. Uh, so the St. Paul's area is a big piece, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that some out front tonight, but that'll be a, uh, certainly a focus for us when you all come back. Um, we've talked a lot in this room about our – we have a lot of publicly owned property that, um, that should be in the stream of commerce, and uh, we'll bring to you a process for uh, getting those properties back in the stream of commerce. Heard a lot last week at the meeting about uh, code enforcement, and so we're going to give you some information, but I, I suspect that ends up being a, a, a retreat topic. It's a tough one to get a lot of um, depth of conversation in this room in, in 10 or 15 minutes. So I anticipate that being a, a, um, a retreat topic. Uh, we've talked about, just like the gem lot piece, we've got a lot of land in Huntersville, and we want to talk about that. Okay, just real quick on yeah. for just something for yeah. Mike and um, James to talk about that there's – citizens that are ready to volunteer to be do a citizens committee to look into code enforcement in Norfolk and to give feedback on that and that may be something you want to start sooner than waiting till September because we're all really hearing a lot about code enforcement again um, which I haven't heard as much in year it's been a couple of years that I've heard this much discussion happening in the community but it's creeping back up but I, I think one way to be proactive about that is to get some citizen volunteers involved in that. And I know Angela and I have met with one that's volunteered to chair it, 
Um, <laughs> but uh, that's something that we would, I think, would be great to have happen before you even get to September. Yeah, so if you've got somebody you want us to talk to, just yeah. give us a name. And that's can great. I add to that? Yes, ma'am. Martin maybe can add to this. Is I would really appreciate if we could um, have a delegation to sit down with the judges and the legal system to see if they could help us understand what we're going through and to work together. We've talked about this in the past, and I think this latest episode has brought that up again. We have way too many continuances, and uh, it really thwarts our and, abilities. It may to go towards position. our legislative package, too, because right. we may need to request some changes. And so, I, you know, I don't know who's the best one, whether it's um, Martin or, or Bernard or Kenny, to sit down with the delegation, but I'd really appreciate us moving with equal speed on that. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, re I think, recreation, I've, I've heard a lot from you all. We talked about it today. Um, the importance of um, having facilities and additional facilities to what we have, uh, but ultimately a sustainable uh, maintenance strategy for open space and parks. And so we'll talk to you some about that. On education, you know you've got the Back to School Fest on, uh, on August 26th. Um, but we're, we'll, build, we'll continue to build toward that conversation about a funding formula um, and uh, a lot of conversation uh, in the council chambers about facilities. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Manager, um, under education, um, for your consideration, every year we come back and we say that we're going to have meeting, ongoing meetings with Norfolk Public Schools, and if, if that's something that you and Norfolk Public Schools can work out, the joint meetings, as well as that um, the city and Norfolk Public Schools can plan on the agenda topics together that focuses on our priorities. Because one thing I suggested last year and previous was looking at the initiatives for Norfolk Public Schools and pairing them up with the priorities of the, the city of Norfolk because there is some interest there, um, especially with the housing and and public safety, it all involves one. And so if you could give that to us, that would be great as well. Okay. And we get a jump start on it, um, and it'd be ready for us, because we got to do this early. Okay, and two things that are happening are, uh, Dr. Boone, senior staff, and our senior staff are meeting on a, on a monthly basis, and uh, mayor, vice mayor, chair, board chair, uh, vice chair, and um, uh, Dr. Boone and I are, are uh, meeting. If, uh, we missed our last meeting. We're, we're getting that rescheduled. Um, I can't, like, get the update on that. I mean, just a brief bullet points, maybe, of what was discussed in those yeah. meetings, because you guys are in them, we're not in them, sure. and we have no idea what's going on in them. And so if it's something that you're dealing with or talking about and constituents bring it to us, we don't go, well, I don't know anything about that. And then you all are already discussing it. At least we have, you know, some form of communication to know what you're talking about and what issues you're discussing. And, you know, that would be very helpful for us as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Lifelong Learning Commission, uh, we've talked about, and we'll get that uh, launched this fall. Uh, public safety, you've heard me say, and, and you're seeing us spend a lot of time, I, th I think we... Um, you know, we get dinged a lot about regionalism and um, how effective we are with regionalism or may, perhaps in, at times ineffective. I think um, public safety is a place where um, uh, the folks in that industry, they just by their very nature, they want to collaborate and, and want to collaborate uh, among themselves, but also uh, cross city lines. And we think we'll bring some interesting things to you uh, around the sort of broader picture of homeland security in the region. Uh, first net, you saw the governor. Uh, Joe will be the f first state uh, in, the, in the U.S. To, to, to join FirstNet, and so we'll come to you and talk about that's this idea of getting everybody on the same uh, uh, radio frequency, and uh, so we'll bring you uh, some uh, thoughts on how we get involved in that as a, as a city. And then um, you saw last week a lot of emphasis uh, from a fire perspective on uh, bystander initiative, Stop the Bleed, and um, uh, Pulse Point, and some of those sorts of things. Um, technology, uh, uh, to move beyond you all specific uh, priorities, uh, we'll continue to focus on open data, uh, resilience, a uh, lot happening, continuing to happen relative to 
uh, Chesterfield Heights and the NDRC grant, and that'll certainly come back to you. And uh, one of the things, we'll, we'll start spending some real money there and want you all to know what we're doing there. Chris talked about the, the core study that uh, Colonel Kelly stood here and talked to uh, you all about, and obviously that'll come forward. And then just uh, just other stuff that uh, doesn't neatly fall into your priorities. Uh, from a finance perspective, perspective, in all likelihood, we'll have a large bond sale um, before too long. Rating agency visits will be really important, and we want to have the rating agencies actually come to Norfolk. Uh, you know, historically, uh, most of the time, cities go to New York. It's just it's just convenient and efficient. Uh, but we think the, the 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 Norfolk story is one that you need to see and uh, and feel, and um, so they'll uh, come in the fall. You know about the zoning code rewrite, and certainly that'll. Uh, continue to move forward. And then a lot of conversation is, is uh, you all talked about uh, code enforcement. I think another one we're hearing a lot about is parking. And so coming back to you all with a parking strategy that um, uh, is not only about supply, but the management of that supply, uh, the fees that we charge for parking, we're, we're probably going to push the envelope with you a little bit on to challenge you to maybe raise some fees that uh, we haven't raised in a while. But also, is there is there a role? There are some things that are happening from a technology perspective that I'm not sure you all know about. I think Ms. McClellan, with, um, uh, Bart shared some things with her recently, but I want you to know sort of, sort of what we're doing there. Yes, ma'am. On parking, um, can you all look at um, it? it it may not be as much of a safety issue now because it's the summer and it stays dark until 9 o'clock. But when we have special events in our parking garages and it's cash only, at 501 it's dark in the winter and with Waterside and the main, it's just not safe having those parking attendants in those little booths with all that cash money. So there should be a way that we can accept credit cards to you know, so that it is from a safety perspective, and then those of us who don't carry cash, it would just be extremely, <laughs> you know, helpful. But anyway, but just a yes, primarily a safety yeah, issue. We're, we're, we're looking at that very hard, and um, we'll keep you apprised. And then from a facilities perspective, obviously we've got the plaza, the Civic Plaza here that's, uh, that's continuing to go forward, Selton Arcade that's continuing to go forward, and uh, both inside and outside. And then on the arts and cultural uh, front, um, we've got the study that's going on with Chrysler Hall and obviously the work that's going on with Scope. So those things will come back to you uh, in the fall uh, as well. Um, organizationally, um, again, we're building toward the retreat September 18, 19. And um, uh, it doesn't feel like we feel like we just adopted the budget, and yet we're talking about the 19 budget. So that'll all, that process will start pretty quickly. And, and we really want to use the retreat to really start to get a sense of the things that are important to you all so that those are the things that we start to resource and just stay on uh, code enforcement for a minute. If we want to change how we're doing code enforcement, then we need to resource that, and then that needs to become a conversation uh, that gets embedded um, in our budget proposal. Uh, you heard from Yvonda and uh, Mike and Chris about the legislative agenda. That'll get going in earnest, but we'll, we'll have that piece. The one, the one comment I make to you there, and I think we do this pretty well, is um, uh, less is more in all likelihood. In other words, what are the things that are really, really important to us and, and have a pretty tight uh, package that, that perhaps has other cities that are supporting it as opposed to throwing the laundry basket or the, uh, the, the kitchen sink out there. Um, we've got some key, some key roles that I've got to get filled uh, now that you all finally found a city manager. We've got to find some uh, some key roles in terms of the uh, chief marketing officer, a couple of deputy slots, a uh, public works director. We all said goodbye to, uh, to David Ricks uh, last week and um, a couple of other key slots. And then one of the things that you all have been um, uh, clear to me about and one of the things we want to bring forward to you in all likelihood in the retreat is that dashboard, that, that set of metrics that, that we are going to um, uh, put before you all on a regular basis that, that really um, um, measures our success and measures our performance. So I know that was quick, but I just want you all to sort of have this, and as I said, I'll put it in your Friday packet, um, but give you plenty to think about as we go forward uh, during this uh, five-week recess. So, Mr. Manager, yes, for the dashboard, mm -hmm. do you have a copy of the da the last dashboard we, we have? It has a list of everything. And so just a couple of weeks ago, check, check, check. We were on schedule for everything. I think there's only one item um, left on that initial dashboard. All right. All right. But I, I'll be more than willing to share that with you. It's so cool well, thank you. to, All to right. share. Glad to hear we're on track. track. Yeah. Right. We're on track. Good. All right. Good to go. You ready? So we'll do Nighthawks next, uh, next yeah, time. Yeah, I'm sorry. James, I'm sorry, pal. Uh, to, let me say this. Y'all know this uh, as we're running upstairs. 
James has done a phenomenal job, and um, uh, that program is being replicated in other cities now, and I think we've got great success. And, um, James, who's doing? 117. Yeah, okay. close to two days. Phenomenal turnout. What city announced that they have a, a similar program this year? Portsmouth started. Chester. Uh, Virginia Beach is doing a program in Lake Edward that looks yeah. awfully similar. Charlotte. So is Charlotte. <laughs> James, you're not allowed to travel to North Carolina, buddy. <laughs> My favorite white is when you said I came from the black.